Okay, well welcome everyone. Uh, welcome everyone to the first uh, ASC test preparation webinar here delivered from the ASC headquarters here in downtown Leesburg, Virginia. Uh, my name is John Tisdale. Uh, as Dave mentioned in his early intro, um, I am the executive director of test development operations. Um, I uh, actually work right here in the ASC uh, technical department where we actually work with the uh, test and test question development. Uh, so uh, put together a presentation for you tonight based on a lot of input we get from uh, technicians who uh, obviously contact us after testing, particularly after you've had trouble testing. And uh, so a lot of the in, uh, information that I've put into this, uh, into this webinar for you tonight <clears throat> comes directly from you, uh, our technician customers who are out there trying to earn ASC certification and uh, have asked us for some help. So hopefully what I'm going to pass on to you is going to uh, give you some guidance and insight uh, and uh, help you to be more successful testing and more importantly uh, help you have a, a very successful career out there as a technician. Um, really I, I start this off with uh, you know the one of the main questions that we get from technicians who uh, have taken an ASC test and have been unsuccessful they ask me the same question time and time again John what technical content do I need to study to pass an ASC test and unfortunately my answer to them is is the exact same every time I don't know because everybody's needs are different. Um, your needs are different than my needs in terms of the technical knowledge or the technical knowledge gaps that we have to fill with training and education. So I'm not going to be able to actually fill those voids for you. But what my objective is to show you how to determine your personal needs for skill reinforcement. This will help, this should help you uh, select uh, better select study material that's focused to meet your specific needs, uh, or you know engage in training classes or seminars or webinars that are going to help enhance your skill set to to a help you be uh, to help you be more successful in, in taking an ASC test and passing an ASC test, but more importantly um, help enhance your skill set uh, in the shop and, and make you a better technician. That's really our that's really our goal is to is to help you with your career, not just uh, get ASC certified. Um, what I also want to do is give you some, uh, I'm going to give you some tips about um, how to use the new computer-based testing online interface. Um, so uh, that being said, let's take a quick overview of what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, as I said, we're going to talk about test preparation methods. This is going to be the first segment that I'm going to run that's, uh, that's going to help you um, um, evaluate yourself based on information that we publish about the tests uh, to help you better select study material. I'm going to give you some tips for test taking. We're going to talk about how to evaluate test questions. Um, one of the things you're going to hear me say multiple times tonight, test questions tell you in words what you do in the shop. Okay? And so in order, to, uh, in order to grasp the concept of what you're doing in the shop when we give you a test question, you, you have to evaluate questions very specifically in order to do that. I'm going to give you some tips about that. Uh, as I said, I'm going to give you an introduction to the computer-based testing format. About halfway through this presentation, I'm going to transition. You'll have to bear with me with some technology. I've got to shift over a uh, slide to the, to the active screen um, to show you an actual demo of the computer-based testing interface. If you have not taken a test in a computer-based testing Center yet, um, and even if you have, I'm going to show you some tips about how to use the functionality of that interface to make yourself more efficient uh, when you're taking tests. Um, as we go along, we're going to have some segments for uh, questions and answers. Um, obviously, as David mentioned, the, uh, the question box is open. You can ask questions uh, as we go along uh, while I'm presenting, uh, and Tony and Dave will do as good of a job as they can to answer your questions on the fly uh, during the presentation. So. Moving right along, um, you know, techs always ask me, John, what's going to be on an ASE test? Okay, and fortunately, ASE, ASE publishes information that answers that very question. That information that we publish is the ASE test information that you'll find in the uh, study guides that we that we publish, uh, which we'll get into here in just a moment. So, um, we, what we do is we create. Uh, test outlines for each and every test and they're laid out in the following format. We have a test specification, a task list, and this test specification and task list, that's the outline of the test and the task list are all the skills that we as technicians should know and understand when we're doing that work for a living. Whether it be engine repair, brakes, suspension, steering, what have you, the task list outlines the skills that the questions in the test are going to be based on. And We're going to talk about that more in detail here in just a minute. The in, the in, interesting thing that I want to share with you, this 
This is foundational test content information because the test questions relate directly to the content that we outline in the task list for each test. There's no tricks. Um, what you see is what the test questions are going to be based on, and that's how you'll have an expectation of what knowledge base you have to have walking into the test center. Um, it gives you an idea just how new a technology are our test questions relating to. Okay? Um, do you have to know cutting edge technology or you know, are we staying, you know, does ASC testing, we usually stay a few years behind you know, cutting edge technology so all technicians will have an opportunity to see new technology um, after it gets out of warranty and gets out of the dealer shops getting uh, warranty services performed. So we want to have you have the best opportunity to have seen technology to gain experience. That's the only fair way to test you on content. This information is published by ASC. Okay? So how is it published? The way it's published is in study guides. Okay? ASE, we publish a separate study guide for each test series. And what I mean by test series, you see the automobile test series study guide shown here on your screen tonight. We also have a separate study guide for <coughs> collision repair, medium heavy truck tests, school bus, and so forth. Every, every certification area that we offer specific certification for auto, automotive professionals, we have a separate study guide. What this study guide contains are all the test specifications and the task lists for all the tests in that series. So everything that you need from the automobile test series is located in one place. Now, let's really review the format that ASC test information uses and how it's found in the study guide. Basically, this is the front page of a, of a uh, task list okay, for the engine performance test as we're showing here. What you see here is the test name. The test specification, and for those of you that have taken a test, uh, that looks very similar to your score report that you see when you, uh, when you walk out of the test center. Uh, same idea. We're telling you that the test specification um, you know, outlines the general content areas, and we'll talk about more of that in detail. The meat of these, this uh, test content information is the task list. Those are the very skills that we as technicians perform when we're working on cars for a living, uh, fixing cars for, for our customers. So. Let's break all these down separately, and we'll, we'll talk about each, each component uh, on its own. The test specification, okay? What is a test specification? Well, it's really it's a test outline, okay? It's, it's kind of like the glossary, if you will. Um, what we want to do is we, we take this specialty area, whether it be engine performance or brakes or suspension steering, and we break it down into subcomponents. Those subcomponents we call content areas. And in those content areas, we assign numbers of questions. All right, and that's how the test is built based on the total number of questions that we show in each content area. We'll talk about that a little bit more in detail in a moment. So let's let's take a look at how that's done. So for the test specification, we show you the content area, the number of questions in the test, and then the percentage of the test um, that that uh, that that. Um, relates to or that identifies for the weighting of that content area for that test. So for general diagnosis in the engine performance test in this example, um, there's 12 questions in the test. Well, that's 25% of the test. Okay? So that weighting kind of gives you an idea, wow, that's, that's you know, a good one-fourth of the test. That must be you know, pretty, pretty uh, important content. This test is balanced pretty well across all the content areas. Um, but uh, you see 25% is quite a bit. Um, if, you've, uh, if you've tested and have not been successful, this information can actually help direct you to specific test content to study, okay? Um, because the test content within, a, within one of these content areas has tasks associated with it, and that's what we're going to really t spend some time on because that's what I want to show you uh, how to evaluate yourself based on the task list. But uh, let's understand, what is a task list? You've, you've heard me say it, uh, the task list identifies the job skills in each content area for that test. Why is that task list so important? I've already told you the answer to that question. The test questions relate directly to the job skills that we publish in these task lists, okay? in these test outlines that we publish for you. That's the way, that's how you know what is going to be on the test. What's going to be on the test are all of the skills that we've shown you and questions that relate directly to those skills. Okay, so a task list structure, let's, let's review that because this is where I want to um, share with you some real insight on how you can use this information to evaluate your technical knowledge, okay, before you come in and take an ASC test. So 
on the uh, on content area A uh, page of the task list, here we again, we identify that content area we showed you in the test specification, general diagnosis, and we tell you there's 12 questions. Well, what I'm, what I'm showing you here on the screen is the sum total of tasks that we are going to test you on in, in asking you 12 questions. So I'm sure some of you are already scratching your head saying, well, John, there's eight tasks, but there's, but there's 12 questions. How are you going to ask me eight, eight, uh, 12 questions about only eight skills? Let's, let's see how that works, okay? Because we're going to evaluate a couple of these tasks, and I'll show you exactly how, that hap how we can do that, okay? Let's look at skill number five, okay? This is how I want you to approach one of these task lists, because this is really the meat of uh, preparing yourself and understanding what you know and don't know about a, a skill area that you're trying to earn certification. So the way you evaluate yourself against these uh, skills in the task list is read a skill and decide, hmm, how much do I know or don't know about the specific technology associated with that? So I'll illustrate a couple of examples here. Uh, task five, perform engine manifold vacuum or pressure tests, determine needed action. Well, anybody that knows anything about engine performance, that's a, that's a pretty broad statement to make, okay? Um, what could I ask you about, uh, what kind of questions could I ask you about with, with uh, engine manifold vacuum testing? I, I could ask you a question about loaded mode, couldn't I? Okay? Or running compression, or cranking compression, all of which are, you know, paramount to uh, performing, you know, these tests to determine um, engine integrity under certain circumstances. So right there, you know, how could I ask you 12 questions about eight tasks? Well, I could ask you a, a question about cranking vacuum. I could ask you uh, a question about um, vacuum in a loaded mode, okay? Two different skills, probably two different problems causing an incorrect reading or something that you're not uh, expecting to see in a properly running engine. So, so these are all the, the, so what I want you to understand is that task is written very generally for a reason because what, what you need to do is determine how much do you understand about all the elements of the performance of that skill in the shop, in the bay, when you're working on a car. And if, if your answer to that question is, you know, I probably don't know as much about that or maybe I don't know the importance of cranking vacuum, you know, when I'm doing a cranking vacuum test, what would I use that for? You know, put a check mark next to that. Okay, uh, when you're when you're going through your evaluation, put a check mark next to that skill. You've just identified something that you need to study. Okay, um, so let's let's look at another one. Um, task six: Perform cylinder power balance test. Determine needed action. Okay, again, you know what is a power balance test? Do you even know what we're using a power balance test for? Um, do you know how to properly set up an, an engine for a power balance test? What conditions have to be uh, met in order to perform a, a power balance test properly? Um, when I after I uh, that's I haven't even performed a power balance test and I've I've uh, intrigued you with a bunch of ideas about just the idea of a power balance test. Now after you've performed a power balance test, what kind of readings are you looking for? You know we could we could go you know maybe a little old school with an RPM drop okay result or you know, coil KV okay. But either way, I could ask you a question either you know either with either type of a result, and you need to know what that result uh, means. And, and with respect to what's broken in, in the uh, setup of that question and making your diagnosis, which is selecting your answer to the question, okay? So again, the idea right here isn't really so much answering questions, but it's answering the question to yourself, how much do I know about this skill? And if the answer to your question, when you're asking yourself in the mirror, you know, probably not as much as I should, you've just found another skill area that you need to study up on, put a check mark next to it, and move on, okay? When, when you go through the entire task list for any given test that maybe you're struggling with to try to earn certification for, take the time to go through the entire task list in this fashion. All of those check marks, what they represent is your personalized study plan that you need to fulfill in order to expand your skill set that you've already identified for yourself that needs to, that you need in, you know, skill enhancement to uh, A, help you be more successful in taking your ASE test for sure, um, but more importantly, again, and I'm going to stress this, you're going to hear me t say this a million times tonight, more importantly, um, to make you better tech in the shop, because that's really ASC's mission, is, is to help you have a great career uh, as an auto technician and be the best you can be for uh, fixing, you know, fixing vehicles and solving vehicle problems for your customers and performing service.
Um, I won't go through any more you know, specific examples. I think you get kind of the idea. Um, but again, that's, um, that's, uh, that's really um, this information we publish. We'll be talking about how you can get your hands on this. Um, this is published by ASE for free. Um, it's available to you free of charge. Um, you know, the only thing we sell here are, are tests. We, we give away webinars too. So um, you know, we, we want to put this information in your hand to help you be successful in preparing um, so that you're successful when you come in and uh, try to, try to uh, earn your certification. Um, so just for a quick, uh, quick overview, again, for the task list, use it for your self-evaluation. Okay? While you're doing your self-evaluation, though, Guys, guys and gals, you've got to be honest with yourself about what you know and don't know. I know a lot of us have been doing a lot of, you know, doing this kind of work for years. Um, you know, a lot of us have learned what we've learned by, you know, learning OJT, you know, on the job. And, you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes, you know, we might have learned to do things maybe not quite correctly. Um, not that we're, you know, we're bad technicians, but, um, you know, there, there may be some, some you know, steps that we, we skip that, uh, and maybe we don't even know that we're skipping them. Um, you know, performing a cranking compression test, okay? A lot of people don't know that the throttle needs to be blocked open in order to get correct results, um, to, to get the cylinder pressure correct in order to get correct results. So it, we may not even know that that's, that's uh, um, uh, something that's important to that skill, but we've got to be honest with ourselves about what we don't know, know and don't know. Selection of study material is key because once you do your self-evaluation, um, what we're going to, what we're hopefully going to do with your self-evaluation information that we've put in your hand is help you select study material. You'll be able to actually look through a book and say, "Is it going to help me learn this?" Okay, because if the answer is no, move on to something else. Okay, because you know, unfortunately, I hear a lot of technicians who've taken the same test multiple times and not been successful, they're like, well, you know, I've read this thus and such a study guide, you know, cover to cover every time before testing. Well, but guys and gals, if, if you only do what you're doing right now, you're only going to learn what you're learning right now, that book may have carried you as far as it can carry you um, with, with respect to the information that, that publishers put in that one book. Unfortunately, there's, I don't know too many books that are one book that cover you know, the, the entire uh, scope of skills that we as technicians need to know and understand in the shop when we're doing this work for a living. Um, our task list will guide you to understanding which of those skills you need to, to uh, study up on in hopes that it was gonna, it's going to help co connect you to the proper study material that's going to teach you what you, need to, what you need to know so that you're going to use your time more efficiently when you're preparing for testing and you're not going to waste your time studying a bunch of stuff maybe that you already know and you're just reinforcing strong links in the chain. We want to reinforce the weak links in the chain. Practice the new skills. It's like anything else. You know, we, we go to training sessions, seminars. We maybe do some hands-on training if we're lucky enough. And, and then we go back to the shop and we get caught up in, you know, getting the cars out that we got to get out. And maybe we don't practice those new skills immediately. And then we got, they kind of, you know, we kind of lose them. So my, my point to you is practice those new skills. The more you practice and do something, the more it becomes ingrained uh, in, in your memory. And uh, you're going to remember those things you know, when it comes time to, to performing them again, particularly if it's a new skill that you're just learning for the first time. The more you practice it, the more it becomes part of you, um, the more you're going to remember how to, how to, uh, how to do that uh, or perform that skill when, you, uh, when you're faced with having to use it in the shop or to answer a question on the ASC test. Um, again, I'm going to stress it again, take time to study and practice. You know, your time that you study and practice, it's time away from other things that you could be doing, Why, you know, watching a ball game, you know, going and doing something else, recreation, whatever. But, you know, taking the time to study and practice, it's a commitment to yourself, not just to pass an ASC test, but again, what? To increase your skill set to help make you a better tech. That's really, uh, that's really our number one, number one goal. So at this point, we're going to take, uh, take a formal question break. Dave, we have any uh, group questions that have come up out there? Yeah, we've had uh, several good ones, John. Um, let me put this one to you this way. As far as, can you give any recommendations in general terms about scheduling when it comes to CBT, um, how the appointments run? I mean, is it based, I guess what I'm saying is, is it based generally on just which test you take 
and the number of tests as far as figuring how that's going to fall into an appointment. Um, let me let me make sure I understand the question question correctly. So you you want to know as far as scheduling the test, how to accurately schedule yourself for testing for an appointment. Well, what it is is without knowing how many tests a person is going to take and which tests they're going to take, it's kind of hard to know whether they would need to take you know one or several appointments to take those. Oh tests. right. Okay. So, right. Um, very good question. Um, on the new, under the new CBT testing program, um, the amount of time that you need for testing in an appointment is really based on, um, you know, how much time you have available that day and how much time uh, the test center has available on the same day. Okay. Um, and what I mean by that, our CBT testing platform is convenient that you can you can uh, schedule testing on a day and time that's convenient for you. Um, but it's also the caveat is it also has to be the same day and time that's convenient with the test center for the time slot that they have available. Um, so really, uh, the answer to that question is it's as many tests that you want to take in one sitting, um, given the amount of time you have available that day. Okay. For example, uh, most of the certification tests, A1 through A8, you have a, a, an hour, some a little bit more. Okay, the A6 test, I think we have about an hour and 15 minutes, a little more illustration intensive. So, you know, what you have to ask yourself, wow, well, if I'm going to take three tests that day in an appointment, that's three hours of testing time. Okay, but your appointment time is going to be a little bit longer because they build in a little bit extra time. We're going to talk about testing time versus appointment time in a little bit. But uh, they build in a little extra buffer time there to get you checked in and have you have the opportunity to go through the testing platform tutorial and so forth. So really, it's, it's based on convenience. It's all about convenience. Have anything John, this is Tony. Uh, I have another question here. Um, there's another question here. Um, they want to know why that we don't tell them uh, the answers to the questions they they missed. Um, do you want to explain why we don't report on specific questions? Sure. Um, the questions that we offer for certification, um, those are written by subject matter ex experts from the field. Um, those questions are, are not only written in a group environment by very knowledgeable um, uh, technicians, um, they're also vetted uh, through uh, pre-testing. You're going to see um, we tell you the test specification for a given test is going to tell you there's 50 questions in that test. Well, I can tell you when you come to the computer-based testing center, you're going to see 60 questions in that test. Ten of those questions are newly written questions by our SMEs. Okay, and what we are doing is we're gathering statistical analysis on those questions to make sure they're clear, concise, understandable, okay, and only have one right answer. We have to do this if we're ever going to use those questions to make a pass-fail decision in a future test, and that's also how we introduce new technology into the test as technology changes and we, uh, we introduce that technology in a test update. If we expose the questions to you to let you to use them to study, um, wow, the investment that we have in, in all the, the creation and the vetting of those questions would go out the window. We'd compromise the test. And so that's why you know, we, we kind of closely hold our, our questions to the vest and, and not put them out there um, for study. But what we do do is we give you the skills, the skills and the task list to, to really back into the technology that you, that you need to understand. Um, because questions, quite frankly, questions are designed to test your knowledge. They aren't designed to teach you anything. Um, although we can, we maybe can learn where we might have gone wrong in a question. I'm not saying you, you know, you, questions don't, you know, evaluating test questions doesn't help you. But you know, they really, they really kind of point you in the direction of, hey, I, I probably need to study up on engine compression. Well, you know, you might be able to figure that out for yourself if you evaluate yourself against the task list, and we don't have to expose the test questions and compromise our test material. It would, it would increase the cost of our of the ASC program exponentially if we were to put tests out there. Um, for, for study, you know, after we administer them. Um, so it's just impossible. Good question. I hear that one a lot. John, here's maybe one more that uh, we should uh, entertain, and that is, uh, are the research tests harder, question-wise, than a regular certification test? Um, 
Yes and no. You know, the, 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 harder of a, the harder part of a recertification test is one thing that we do uh, try, to, try to accomplish uh, in the test development department when we actually physically create the, uh, the test form that you're going to see for certification. You know, we try to introduce the newer technology questions, the ones that have been, you know, written at, at the most recent um, test review uh, workshop and have gone through the vetting process for us to know that those questions are fair and accurate to be asking in order for you to, you know, to get a pass fail decision made when you're trying to earn your recertification test. So the difficulty statistically there really isn't any difference um, in, in the uh, numeric value of difficulty of the test, but there might be a perceived difficulty because there may be some newer technology in there that, uh, that we're expect, you know, as an as a experienced technician coming in after five years or ten years for recertification that you should probably know or understand um, for research. So the newer technology might give you a perception that it's a little harder. Okay, so anything else? We're going to move on? Let's go right ahead and move on, John. Okay, very good. Okay, let's, um, we're, I'm going to shift gears and, and uh, we've talked about how to evaluate yourself. So um, what I want to do now is, is we're going to review the question styles, um, but what I want to share with you is some tips about how to evaluate all test questions. We're not going to go through specific test question styles. Um, you've heard me already say this before once tonight, but I'm going to say it again now. Test questions tell us with words what we actually do in the shop. So how you evaluate a test question is important in order for you to understand um, what you're being tested on. Um, you, you need to understand the situation that you're being tested on. Okay? So, so how do we do that? Okay? The way we do that is you want to read the test question for context. What, is, what does context mean? Context means understand, what, understand what's being asked. Understand in what framework okay, that, that you're being asked. You know, what's the situation that you're in? Again, you know, we're doing this stuff in the shop. Okay? Well, a question, a test question kind of stages a scenario, or a pair scenario. So it's important for you to understand the context of that scenario before you even start looking at content. Okay? Is it a, you know, is it a diagnostic procedure or a repair procedure? You know, are we doing a root cause analysis, um, like you know, diagnosing low fuel pressure, or are we performing a repair, you know, like tor torquing lug nuts? Okay? Um, so understand the context in, what, in what's being asked. Um, Analyze all your answer options, okay, and put yourself in the situation. And then what you want to do is, then you want to read each question for content, okay. And when you read the question for content, you want to analyze key information in the question, not in the question, in the setup of the question, but also all of the answer options, okay. The setup of the question will give you symptoms test information that we've, that's been obtained for you. Remember, you're not doing anything in the shop, but what we've done is we've performed tests for you. So we've got symptoms and, and test uh, diagnostic information, results uh, that we're providing for you to analyze. And that's the key information that we're giving you in the setup of the question. Because remember, every ASC question is structured in a manner that is in the same manner that we think as technicians. It's effect and cause. We get effects. We get symptoms, diagnostic information, and our job is to determine the cause of the problem. So you have to not only uh, understand what's being asked in the set of the question, but in all the answer options. Okay? Look for keywords in the answer options. Open, shorted, stuck open, stuck closed. Very specific circumstances that can change the complexion of how that vehicle behaves in, in, uh, in that test scenario. So, um, we have to be very specific in the way that we word the questions, so you have to read the content very specifically. Um, most important thing is take the information that we provide for you, provide you face value, okay? Don't read into the question. Everything that you need is in front of you. Um, as soon as you start introducing information that we haven't provided you, other than your technical knowledge of that skill, okay? Um, th that's when you go down the wrong road. Don't read into the question. We've given you symptoms, diagnostic information, test results in order to arrive at a conclusion of the four options that we've provided. Okay? One of those is correct and three are incorrect. So that's really context and content. Understand the situation and, and make sure you understand you know, the content of the question, what, what we're providing you for uh, when you're performing your analysis of that question. Um, final recap of test taking tips. Use that task list as a benchmark. Um, find really good study material. Um, 
one of the things that we touched on, uh, register early. Um, don't wait until the last minute. You know, you're going to sign up for testing, and then you know, you're going to be responsible for making your appointment. You know, make your appointment early. Make your appointment as soon as possible, because if you want to get a day and time that's convenient for you, particularly if you're taking multiple tests, as, as we uh, illustrated in that one question example, um, the sooner you make your appointment, uh, the, more op the better opportunity you're going to have for getting the day and time uh, and block a time that's convenient for you. Review your appointment confirmation. Okay, that recaps what you've registered for. Um, the way you receive that now is it's, uh, it's sent by email. Um, and if for some reason you didn't get it uh, through email, maybe spam soap blocked it or something, um, you can always get it through your MyASC account. Um, more test taking tips. These are really kind of um, rudimentary, but I, you know some some people don't really uh, embrace the idea of being well rested. Well, you know. You know, days that you're in the shop and you're tired, you know, you might not be performing at your tops. Well, probably the same thing's going to happen in the test center. So to the extent you can, you know, be well rested. Um, eat a light meal, not real something heavy that's going to make you sleepy, um, but eat something light. Keep your energy stores up and, and uh, you know, keep the brain function at, at top level. You know, reading test questions isn't something that we, we do every day. You know, we read a lot of service information and so forth, but analyzing test questions, you know, a little bit different than what we, we're accustomed to. We want to make sure our brain's sharp. Um, arrive early at the test center. Um, that kind of goes without saying. I want to make sure that, uh, that you, know, you get there on time um, and, and get there for your appointment promptly since we're scheduling appointments now. Security at the test center. Um, you know, I'm going to touch on this because this is something that you know, technicians have talked a lot with, uh, with us a lot about. Um, security at the test center. Why is there test security now? You know, we have people that are familiar with the testing program that we had previously, you know, this is a, this is a um, total about face from what we've, we've had in security in the past. And the idea is, is that it, it isn't just test security, um, ladies and gentlemen. It's not just security of the test. That is part of it. But it's also, more importantly, it's personal security. It's security of you as an individual in a testing center um, with a bunch of other people that are testing. Um, I don't have to say, I know everybody's seen the news over the last few weeks. Um, you know, it just goes to show you that you know, sometimes you just don't know what could happen. Um, so with security of the test center, it ensures you know, not only um, security of the test and the validity of the test, that you, know, you are who you say you are, and you're the one that's taking the test, you're the one that's earning the credential, um, but, but your personal security as well. Um, there's, in most of the test centers, there's, there's lockers where you can put all your personal belongings, your cell phone, watch, um, and they do wand you in most cases. Now, I am going to talk a little bit about CBT in just a minute, uh, the computer-based testing. And one of the things I want to point out is you may experience some differences in, in the security aspects uh, and as well as uh, how the uh, test engine functions. And I'm going to point those out as we go along because um, when we started with this new contractor, that we're testing on two different platforms. They have wholly owned test centers that were, are very stringent with their security. And then they have contracted satellite test centers. The reason we have contracted satellite test centers is to make testing more uh, uh, make, give more testing opportunities for you um, with shorter travel distance. You know, one of the things that uh, we started off with uh, at the beginning of the year was too few at test centers and people in some rural areas that were having to travel an exorbitant uh, distance in order to get to an ASE test, and that's a travesty. So we've been taking some steps to correct that. Um, getting more of these satellite centers online um, is, is the key uh, to us getting tests closer to your home. Uh, so that you don't have to have uh, a long distance to travel. Um, but it does come some, with some differences. And I'm going to point those out as we go along. Security is one of them. Okay? I'll just point that out right now. Um, if you say, hey, I didn't have to lock my stuff up in a locker, John. I, you know, they didn't wand me. You're probably at a satellite test center. Okay, and then bring your photo ID. Got to have a government-issued photo ID. The tests are timed. Okay, there's a complete list of test times on the ASC website. Uh, we will tell you exactly how much seat time you're going to have to answer the questions in that test and how many questions are going to be on that test. And we're going to talk about that when we get into the CBT demo here in just a minute. Um, pace yourself. Be mindful of the clock. Okay, like I said, the tests are timed, and we're going to talk more about the clock in a minute. Um, when to take a break. There's a, there's a specific place to take a break, and I'm going to show you exactly where to take a break when we go through the demo of the uh, CBT interface. The one thing I'm going to say about breaks, I'm going to say it now and I'm going to reinforce it in a minute, you have to make the appointment, you have to make your break quick, okay? Um, this is where I want you to understand, you have, 
there's some buffer time that's built into your appointment. Your overall appointment is from the time you get there to the time you leave. Built into your appointment is the time that's necessary to take the test you're, you've signed up for, okay, based on those timetables that we're going to show you on our website. So if you add those up, there's some buffer time that's built in for your tutorial, okay? Your tutorial doesn't count against your test time, it counts against your appointment time. So there's a little bit of buffer, there's a little bit of fudge in there that you can work with. I'm going to show you where you can take a break okay, using the, CB, using the CBT interface where you can take a break without it penalizing you on the test block for any given test, okay, and I'm going to show you this in detail. Okay, questions, and let's make this kind of quick because we're running short and I've got still a lot to cover. John, one of the things we're hearing a lot from tonight's attendees is what do you recommend for the best testing material, preparation material? And I know that can be kind of a tough one, but uh, if there's any general recommendations you can make, I'm sure they would appreciate it. Yep, um, and, and I'm going to answer this very generically because um, there is a lot of good published material out there that can help you uh, bridge the gap of, of where you know, you're falling short in your skill set. Okay? Um, what I usually encourage um, technicians to, uh, to go engage themselves with is not so much the type of study material out there that's just a bunch of repetitive questions, although you know, questions help us to enhance our test taking skills. Okay, um, But what we need to enhance are our technical skills. Our technical skills are going to help us to understand a question, a test question that's asked of us, and we're going to understand how to diagnose the information in that question in order to arrive at an answer. Same way as we're going to be able to use that knowledge to diagnose the problem with the car and arrive at a conclusion and a repair for the customer that's going to fix the car right the first time. Okay, direct parallel. So what I tell technicians is get study material that's going to teach you at the fundamental basis of the performance of that skill, the knowledge of that skill and the performance of that skill. Okay? If, if, if I'll use electrical as an example. You know, if you're not good with an electrical meter, well, probably the first thing you need to understand is Ohm's law. Okay? Um, because, you know, not that I'm going to give you a specific test of, of the components of Ohm's law, okay, but I am going to ask you questions whether you understand applied voltage. You know, what happens on the feed side of a circuit? What happens on the ground side of an energized circuit? What happens to an electrical meter? Know, what's it supposed to look like? Um, I am going to ask you questions about resistance, uh, about current flow. Okay, so if you don't really understand, you know, the the, the technical fundamentals, the physics involved with that, um, you, you know, you're going to be a little bit lost when it comes to the technical side of, of diagnosis. So, um, find material that that teaches you at the foundational uh, essence of of the of the uh, knowledge of that skill. Anything else? We've had some issues or questions on security, John. Um, some people seem to like the new security process. I think they like it, but um, others, I guess, maybe just because it's, it's, it's so different. Um, any other details you can uh, provide people to expedite their way through the security at the centers? Um, well, yeah, for the security, um, it's, if, you, if you get to the test center and you don't have change in your pocket, uh, the, the, less you're, the less you take with you, the less you're going to have to store away. Um, if you're in a, you know, if you're in one of the wholly owned test centers where we're going to go through the wanding and everything, I mean, you can't even have a nickel in your pocket. Um, it, it's, you know, when they wand you, it's just like the airport. You can't have anything in your pockets. It's metal, um, and that, that, you know, that's what they're looking for. So the less you have with you, the better, and the easier you're going to go through through the security side of it. Really, again, it's it's for, you know, for your protection um, and uh, to make sure that, you know, um, also that, you know, nothing's being taken into the test room that that you know, could assist you with, you know, with cheating. I mean, we are, we are trying to protect that as well. I'm not going to sugarcoat that at all, but it's, it's for test security and it's for your personal security, uh, moreover. So, anything else? John, one of the things we're seeing is about time on CVT, and I believe you're going to get into that, so I don't want to preempt that, and uh, why don't we just keep moving right along. Okay, very good. Um, okay. Um, why the switch to computer-based testing? Well, it came from you, our customers. Um, you, you, our technician customers, have been asking us for years. We want more frequent testing. We, more, we want convenient testing days and times. We want quicker test results. And at the same time, we want to keep the fees, you know, the, the testing fees reasonable. Okay? Well, by some miracle, we were able to accomplish all that with, with computer-based testing. It, it came with some compromise. The first compromise is there are, as I mentioned, two platforms. Um, there's satellite centers and wholly owned test centers. Um, 
the satellite centers, as I said, they give you more access to testing. Um, the testing engine works a little bit different. This presentation that I'm about to show you on the computer-based testing platform is based on the test engine used in the wholly owned test centers. Um, the satellite center is a little bit different, and I will point out the differences as we go along in that, uh, in that computer delivery. Um, mainly the uh, benefits, um, greater scheduling and flexibility, you get your test results immediately, and like I said, we do it at the same price as paper and pencil testing. At a typical Prometric test center, you're going to go through a check-in process, they're going to check your photo ID, you're going to put your stuff away in a locker. Okay, in the testing room itself, there's a proctor walking around. If you have a question or a problem with the, with the uh, computer, you can raise your hand, they'll come assist you. They'll be walking around just monitoring the room. These are not headphones for audio. These are noise-canceling headphones that will be available to you if you don't like to hear noise in the background, you know, with people clacking on computer keyboard and whatnot. So um, those are available to you. Um, familiar testing format, and we're going to be talking about this in just a little bit. Uh, what I do want to emphasize is the demo that I'm about to demonstrate for you is available on, this, on the ASC website. I encourage everyone to go try it out, especially after what I'm going to show you tonight. Remember, go practice. Practice as soon as I teach you. Um, you're going to have a better opportunity to, to ingrain it and understand how this interface works. It's not real complicated, but there's some things I'm going to point out to you that are going to help you hopefully make you a little bit more efficient. Um, you're going to get your instant test results, the detailed score report. You're not going to see this tonight. Um, our demo does not print out a score report, but this is what it's going to look like when you walk out of the test center, uh, what you're accustomed to seeing from us. Um, you get it at the test center. You can always log in uh, to your MyIC account and get it. We're testing four times a year now, uh, two months on, one month off. So we'll be testing January, February, March is off, April, May, June is off, and so forth. Uh, two months on, one month off. We're still testing in May and November during that cycle. Our certifications still have the same expiration, June 30 and December 31. So I want to make that uh, distinction there. So let's take a look at the uh, let's take a look at the uh, user interface here. Um, I want to demonstrate this for you because there's some efficiency that you can gain um, for um, in in using this um, to the greatest benefit. Uh, to help you, and is that uh, is that big enough on the screen, or do I need to maximize it a little bit? I think it's okay, John. Yeah, the demo on the ASC website it's self-paced. Um, the answers are not scored, and you don't get a score report, as I mentioned. But the purpose is to familiarize you with the navigational features of the CBT platform. Okay. Um, now, remember, I told you um, we call this the intro screen. Okay. Uh, the intro screen, you'll see this at the beginning of every test. It's going to tell you the test name, how many questions are in that test, and what the time limit is. Okay, And this is where you go take a break. Let's say you're taking multiple tests. Okay, You've gone through your first test, and you've got to go to the bathroom. Okay, When you get to this screen, before you click here to begin, this is where you go take a break. Okay, But our policy on breaks is... Do so before you start the exam. Okay? As soon as you click here to begin, your time clock for that exam starts. That's a bad thing. You don't want to do that. Okay? Take a break when you hit the intro screen before you click here to begin. Keep your breaks less than 10 minutes total. Remember, I said that test, your test appointment time has some buffer built into it, not a lot. So you know, get up, go, through, go to the restroom, do what you got to do, um, and then come back. You will have to go back through security screening. Uh, they are going to rewind you to make sure you didn't pick up your cell phone or something in your locker because they're not going to monitor you. But that's the other thing. Do not leave the test center. Do not use your cell phone. Do not access any study materials. Do not talk to anybody. Um, it, it's, these are all very important things when you get up out of the testing room and then return um, because they're going to be monitoring that. Okay? Uh, you will have to repeat security check-in. So, um, so that's this is not this is something, and this is one of the main purposes. If you learn nothing else from this webinar, if you learn this tonight, I'm happy because so many technicians are like, I'm taking multiple tests and I can't take a break. How you know? This is something that we actually built into the platform um, after our after our uh, trial run uh, the summer of 2011, uh, so that we were able to build breaks into this. Um, it was over overlooked, so. Um, we're pretty happy that we've been able to accomplish this for everyone. Okay, so uh, you click here to begin. That starts the exam. This is what we call the uh, non-disclosure agreement. This is where you uh, certify that you are who you say you are. If you disagree um, and click next, it's going to go to a uh, statement that says you say you do not agree with the test name and information. If for some reason your test name and information is wrong, raise your hand. Okay, you got to tell the test uh, proctor, hey, this isn't this isn't me for some reason. 
okay? Um, and then we'll, hand, we'll have to handle that specially, okay? If you disagree twice, it shuts the test down and you're done. And I'm not going to demonstrate that for you because I want to keep moving. So let's say you read this, it's the right exam, it's your name, okay? Um, you, you do have a, a couple of minutes on this screen, it is time. So let's you agree who you are and you move on. Okay, now, every uh, test that you take is going to come with a tutorial, okay? Um, I'm going to demonstrate the tutorial for you, okay? But what I want you to know is if you are comfortable with the with the, with the user interface, if you've taken multiple tests and you're like, oh, I know how to do this, you can end the tutorial and move right into your test, okay? Because there's 15 minutes up here logged into your appointment time for this tutorial, remember, that doesn't count against your test time, okay? This is part of your appointment time, all right? But if you don't need the tutorial because you're already familiar with it, you can end tutorial and move on, okay? But for the sake of tonight, I want everybody to see it. So we're going to move on. Um, kind of a one-on-one -on -one approach, you know, using a mouse. You ask me, John, why are you showing me how to use a mouse? I mean, come on, that's, that's like computer 101. Well, believe it or not, when we did some surveys, um, we had a lot of our technician customers that were not familiar with the use of a computer. So, you know, obviously you say, well, if you've gotten to this point, I certainly know how to use a mouse. Well, we also want you to know and understand how to use a mouse when you're selecting answers to the question. And that's the idea here is how do I use the mouse to answer the questions of the test so I get a proper test result, okay? Okay, and then we teach you how to use the buttons, and I'm going to go through these all separately, but each of these, the tutorial explains uh, each button that's in the exam, what it means, um, and what its function is, okay? Um, and we'll talk about those here in just a minute when we get to the actual interface. Flagging the question. I'm going to spend a lot of time on this here in just a minute. I know we're getting close on time. Um, flagging is really what you're going to use, the function you're going to use to help you be efficient when you're taking the test. Okay, this is going to help gain you so much efficiency um, in your new approach to testing. We all had our methods with pencil and paper of making, making a little mark on the answer folder or circle on a question in the book. But it's a new world, and we've got new skills to learn uh, how to use the interface. Navigating through the exam, you can always go back, okay, or move forward, okay. So you have previous question, next question. Um, if you didn't intend on going forward, you can always move back. Um, using the scroll function, um, we'll, we're, we've got an example of this in the user interface. Uh, in our example, we have an example question that uses this. Um, some of the questions do require a little bit of scrolling because of the size of the illustrations, uh, and we'll demonstrate that on a specific question. The review screen, this is where you're going to spend a, a bit of your time um, during testing because the review screen is really your home base, okay? When you're going through and you've answered you know, you've gone through the test on one pass and maybe you flagged some questions that you weren't sure about, you're going to come to the screen and this is your home base, okay? So we're going to spend a little bit of time about on how to use this review screen uh, to, the, to uh, your greatest benefit. Okay, so the end of the tutorial, uh, basically that says, you know, okay, you're comfortable with all the buttonology and the function of the buttons, so uh, you end the tutorial. Got a pop-up warning. Hey, it's always gonna. There's always a safety net when you get when you're gonna get out of something. Are you sure you want to do that? Yes, I do. Okay. So now, as soon as you say yes, I do, that starts the test. Okay. So we've got the first question. Okay. Um, the uh, <clears throat> basically this. Um, what I want to explain here is. Okay, we've got a countdown clock. As soon as I click go, uh, the clock started counting down. Okay. This is something you want to be kind of mindful of. Um, this is how much time you have remaining for that test. Um, if you are, if English is your second language, there's a glossary of terms. Um, this actually isn't live, but in the live version, these are actually hyperlinks to, you know, the, the letter for that word to help you be more efficient, to quickly jump to a word that you want to look up a, in the Spanish glossary. Um, so this glossary is in there if English is your second language. The help screen. Basically, this is just a recap of the tutorial, okay? Using the mouse, navigating buttons, flagging, scroll functions, everything you went through the tutorial, that's a recap of the tutorial, okay? Um, it also tells you the question. You're on question one of five, okay? We have five sample questions here. <clears throat> and then the review screen. You can actually jump to that review screen, okay? Um, and we're going to spend a little bit of time here in a minute. Um, and uh, tell you how, how to use home base to your most benefit, okay? So, um, just for the sake of example, I'm not going to answer a question here. I've read this question, and uh, for some reason I didn't answer the question, okay? Um, what I want to show you in this example is um, this uses the more button. Now, see how you can't see the whole question here. So, you'd click this more button, 
And what that would do in the actual user interface, it doesn't here, is it would move you down to the bottom of the page. It's kind of like a page down button, okay? And what that does, it allows you um, to see the entire question, make sure. And then you could still use your scroll button to, you know, read the question, say, okay, the horns in the circuit only blow with the jumper wires connected between terminal 30 and 87. So then you might need to kind of move a little bit while you're evaluating tech A, what he says, and what tech B says, okay? So you might have to scroll a little bit and, okay, I'm satisfied with um, with my diagnosis. I'm going to uh, you know I'm going to select an answer option and I'm going to move on. Okay. Um, I think what I intended on doing here, for example's sake, is I want to flag that first question. Okay. I flagged that question. I read that question and I wasn't sure about it, so I flagged it. Okay. This question, um, I'm pretty good with it, and I've selected an answer, so I'm going to go ahead and move on. Okay. Um, just for the sake of example, I'm going to leave this question blank, and I'll show you why in a minute. Um, this one here, I read this question, and okay, I'm going to go ahead and select my answer, um, but I'm not real sure about my answer, so I want to flag that question. I, I'm, I'm, it's not like I'm dumbfounded. I've got a pretty good idea with that, but I don't want to waste any more time on this right now. I'm going to come back to it later, so I'm going to, I'm going to select my best option now, and I'm going to flag it. Okay. And then I'm going to move on, okay? And uh, just for the sake of example, I'm going to go ahead and, and maybe I maybe I thought I selected the C. Uh, one of the things I want to show you with the user interface, you can click on the radio button or you can click on the text, okay, to select your option. You can't click out here, okay? This isn't going to change anything. So the example I wanted to show you was um, maybe I clicked here and I thought I answered that question, but it really didn't log my question. So if you're at a Prometric Holian test center, when you come to home base, you've gone through the entire test, okay? At a Prometric Holian test center, you're going to see this count up down here. It's going to tell you that you've got three unanswered questions, two flagged questions, and two questions that you've answered. Now one of these could have been answered and flagged, okay? Uh, it has a flag and an answer given, okay? But the idea here is what we've done is we've grouped questions into a logical little grouping for you to now go back as you have time, okay, and re-review those questions, okay? So let's say you you said, okay, well, the first thing I'm going to do is look at the unanswered questions because I thought I answered every question. So you can actually go back and select this button, review unanswered, and it will actually take you to the first question that you did not select an answer for and allow you to review that question, all right? So that happened to be one of the ones we flagged, so maybe we weren't real sure about it. So we read this question. If we're satisfied that we can select an answer, we're going to go ahead and select an answer. Um, uh, and we're, we're totally satisfied with the answer, so we're going to unflag that question, and we're going to move on. Well, what it does now is the user interface is built to move to your next unanswered question. We've put all those unanswered questions into a group, and it's going to go through those until you've seen all of them. Okay? So... Uh, you're going to go ahead and select an answer to that question, move on. Uh, it's going to give you the, the third question. I'm not really reading these, so if you guys have read this, I'm probably selecting the wrong answer. Um, it's just for example purposes. Okay, we're going to move on. You're going to come back here. Now, see, you've got zero unanswered. you still got one flag. So I want to review my flag question. You're going to be like, oh, yeah, that's right. And maybe, maybe you kept this flag because you selected an answer, but you weren't really sure about it, but you also didn't want to waste a lot of time. This allows you to keep that question flagged until the very end because what I want to teach you with using the flag function is this gives you an opportunity to continue to keep questions that you're unsure about in the flagged mode and then continue that being flagged if you're still unsure of the answer. And then you can, you can sort back through all your flagged questions and answer the ones that you're comfortable with and unflag them. The idea is, is that you want to give your best shot at the, at the most questions that you can answer in the event that you're running out of time, okay? Um, we, we've, you know, we've had some, uh, some experience with technicians saying they've run out of time, although our, our studies fortunately have shown those aren't a great percentage, but any percentage is bad. But, if, but what we want you to do is be more efficient. And the user interface can help you be more efficient, again, by using this flag function to be your marker for questions that you're not sure about. And when you get an opportunity to come back to the review screen and then review those flag questions, if you're still not sure about it, keep it flagged. 
go on to the next question. And then, you know, that next question that you flag, maybe you're comfortable with your answer and you unflag it. And you get it sorted all, you get sorted all the way down to those ones that are still flagged that you're just not sure about. And if you still have time, you take your best shot at them, okay? Because uh, again, I always say, a guess is a guessed answer is better than no answer because if you don't offer an answer, you've got 100% chance of getting the question wrong. Okay? If, you, if you don't offer an answer, you get a 100% chance of answering the question wrong. If you offer an answer that's a swag, you've got a 25% chance of getting it right. So play the odds just like we do with the Powerball lottery. Um, now, the, CB, the IBT, the Satellite Testing Center User Interface, I want to tell you the differences because it's, this is really where the functional differences exist if you're in a satellite test center. In a satellite test center, you don't have this uh, functionality down here, this count up, okay? Um, and you don't have these buttons to, to help you to go back and review those, those groups. What you do have the ability to do is follow the icons. You see this little flagged icon? Well, you have that in the, uh, in the satellite test center. So what you're going to do is you're going to wind up, if there were more questions here, you'd scroll through your list. So if you had a flag question or an unanswered question, you could simply double click on that question, okay, offer your answer for it, flag it or unflag it, okay, and then go back to the review screen. And what you're going to do is you're going to parse through your list of flags and unanswers based on the icons that you see, and you're going to use the double click jump feature to go back to that specific question, and then go back to home base to do your review of the questions uh, where you stand with respect to your responses. And that's really where, that's really again where the functional difference exists between a satellite test center and a Prometric wholly owned test center. Um, now, um, one thing I do want to point out, um, we remember that safety valve that I saw, that you saw pop up, that pop up warning when we were going to leave the tutorial? Okay, well guess what, when I go to submit for scoring, boom, are you sure you want to submit for scoring? Okay, there's a safety net here. Okay, it's going to save you from scoring this test if you weren't really ready and, and uh, hadn't intended on doing that. Um, I also want to tell you about two other pop-up warnings you're going to see. There's a pop-up warning for time. Okay, if, you, you know, if you're just not paying attention to the clock, well, guess what? When there's 15 minutes left, a box is going to pop up saying you've got 15 minutes left. Okay, and you're going to click OK, okay and the box is going to go away. You're going to get a second pop-up that's going to say you've got five minutes left. Okay, so we got warning, pop-up warnings at 15 and 5. 15 minutes left and 5 minutes left, whether you're watching the clock or not. We're going to give you a little bit of a safety net so that you can start to pace yourself based on where you stand with the responses you've given in the test so you can answer, again, as many questions as possible to put your best foot forward in, uh, in achieving a passing score. So it's, it's a little different world. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, it's a little different world in the computer-based environment, and so you know I, I wanted to share some uh, some of these tips with you um, to uh, to help you understand the the functionality of user interface. Again, it's ASE.com. You can go and practice this yourself. Come up with your own scenarios. You know, come up with your own. Um, um, way that you, you do this. I'm just giving you some suggestions how to, you know, how you can sort, you know, flag questions and then get all the way to the end of the test and then go back through your flag questions and then sort them down again. And then if, if you wind up not getting to the last three questions, well, that's better than getting stuck on a, on a question at question number 25 of 50, spending a lot of time on it, not getting to the last 10. If you didn't answer the last 10 questions, maybe you would have answered seven out of those 10 right. You'll never know. Okay? So use the flag function to help you pare them down and put your best foot forward with the, with the content knowledge that you do possess. Um, you know, you, every AC test doesn't require 100% to pass. So, you know, you can miss a few questions and still pass the test. We want you to put your best foot forward with all your responses. So, I'm going to say yes, I want to submit for scoring. Uh, after you for, submit for scoring, you're going to be presented with a survey about your testing experience. We appreciate you taking the time. It's your input on the survey that's, that's created change in the testing program this year. Okay, we've, done, we've been at this for an entire year, and it's all your input that's helped us try to make this better for you, our customer, giving us input. If you don't tell us how you feel, if you don't tell us what you think, we're not going to know. And so um, we're gonna, we take your input very seriously, and the survey helps us with that. As I said, before you leave the test center, you're going to get your test results. A caveat is, of course, if, unless there's some kind of a malfunction, technical problem, um, we had one tonight trying to get started. So um, if that's the case, you can always go to... My ASE, your My ASE account the next day and print out your score report. So if you leave the test center and they can't give you a test score report, don't be mad. 
my SE the next day, and you, and you go in and you can get your score report. Okay? So we've got a safety valve there. Um, that's the end of the demo exam. At the end of the demo exam on the ASE website, we show you some resources that are available to you. They have practice tests. These are you know, tests that we provide remediation. What's remediation? We tell you why A is right, B is wrong, and C is wrong, and D is wrong. Okay? So we'll give you a question scenario. Again, nothing that's going to enhance your technical skills. It'll help you hone your test taking skills and maybe help point you in this, some, some direction of some technical skills. Uh, knowledge that you need to enhance. So the practice tests are a neat resource. We have tips for test taking. That's a nice little tutorial that's available free of charge on the website. And again, as I mentioned, the study guides. Um, we've talked about the study guides already in this uh, presentation. You know, that's what I want you to use to do your uh, self-evaluation. Um, evaluate what you know and don't know about the test content that ASE is telling you. The ones who deliver the certification test, we're telling you these are the skills that were the questions in the test are going to be based on. Okay, you might see some of these out in other publications that you know those publishers swear they've got the latest and greatest, and they might be third edition. Okay, they might be old. Okay, get them from us. They're free of charge and they're up to date. Okay, I can guarantee the information we're giving you um, here is good. So um, let's let's see. Okay, let me get this out of the way and just going to run through here real quick. So um, I'm on the home stretch, so gang, I appreciate you hanging in there. I know I'm running a little over, um, but just for a quick review, um, ASC study guides, we've talked about um, what they are. They're available free of charge, as I've said. They're available in two ways. You can get them off our website from a download page, okay? Um, but I would only encourage you to download segments of that study guide. I wouldn't go in and say, okay, go print the whole study guide off the ASC website. It's about 65 pages. You're going to burn up ink cartridge and a good ream of paper. Um, and I don't want you doing that. If you want the full book, uh, give, us a, give us a call uh, or contact us, uh, uh, contact the ASC customer service. We'll make one available to you free of charge. We'll mail it to you for free. Um, use the test information, as I said. Use it as a benchmark of your readiness for testing. Okay. Um, that's the only way that, that you know, you're going to know uh, what you know and don't know about the test content we're telling you need to know and understand um, when you come in to take the test. Okay? Um, ASE website, ASE.com. Um, like I said, we've got the interactive test taking tips, the CBT test drive. My point in reinforcing this for you, um, you need to do as much as you can before testing to ensure you're ready before you come in and take your test. Um, the more you do ahead of time, the, the better success you're going to have first time through uh, at, at the uh, at the CBT test center uh, and taking and passing your certification test. So, any questions? John, one of the questions that we've been getting here is what percentage does it take to pass an ASE certification test? You just very good it. question. Very, very good question. I hear that one a lot. Um, ASC test passing scores are not based on percentage. <clears throat> They're based on a number correct, and I'm not going to go into the specifics of that. It's a, it's a long, drawn-out explanation. Um, but our, our passing scores are determined test by, on a test-by-test -test basis, um, and the number correct is, is based on what the industry said that we technicians, what bar we should have to jump for that given test. That's why you can have 150 question, 250-question tests in the automobile series. One requires you maybe to take answer 34 correct to pass, one only requires 33, okay? So the bar is weighted specific to that test content, okay? Um, now, just to give you an idea, that having been said, most all of the ASE tests, you can back into a percentage by saying, okay, well, you need 33 out of 50 correct, so what does that percentage represent, okay? So we can back into percentages. So I can give you a range. To answer that question, I can give you a range. Most all of ASE tests require between a 65 and a 72 percent score in order to pass. Okay, 70, 65 to 72. Okay. Anything else? I don't think so at this time, John. Um, probably ought to okay. wrap it up here pretty quick. Uh, one of yep, the things. One of the things I wanted to do is I just wanted to quickly share the results of the previous poll, even though we didn't get 100%. It looks like we had some 
issues with some users trying to vote on an iPad, and uh, for whatever reason, the Safari browser wasn't compliant with that. So that's something we need to look into uh, technologically. Everybody see that poll okay? We had 56% yes, we're certified 44% no. So, you know, kind of a kind of a split. Yep. And then we had one other polling question tonight. This is going to help us about to, this webinar. It's going to help us to uh, to know how to reach it because we're going to be doing more of these in the future and we certainly like to reach our audiences in the best way and the way that you want to be reached. So, we appreciate your responses to this poll. One of the things I'm going to talk about, I was actually going to go to the next slide, but while you guys are polling, um, I'll, uh, I have some what's new at ASE, and I'm not going to go into that in detail. Um, just to let everyone know, as a matter of information, um, there's been a change in the L1 and the L2, the advanced level recertification policy. Um, you no longer are required to have a current uh, A8 or the... Um, uh, the medium heavy truck re prerequisite requirements that are needed for L2. You are no longer required to have those to recertify. You still need them the first time through, um, but when you come in and recertify, we're not asking you to have uh, the, the prerequisites uh, certs still active in order to take the, the uh, L1 and L2 tests for recertification. So a little bit of a policy change. Again, that's come from your input. Um, and we appreciate that input, and you know, like I said, input affects change. And uh, we heard, and we uh, we heeded your uh, we heeded your interests. Uh, our board of directors said, yeah, that makes sense. There's no no reason to keep testing advanced people that have accomplished that on you know the 101 level uh, knowledge in the other exam. So, uh, and our pass rates kind of you know supported the fact that you know most people that take and pass a recertification advanced level test, you know, they, they pass their, their recert on the on the prerequisite, you know, almost 100%. So, so we're not asking you to do that. John and um, Dave, I just want to jump in here. A lot of people have been saying good night, and we want to wish everybody a very Merry Christmas and all the best for the new year. Um, we thank you for attending, and uh, we've been very impressed with the uh, questions we've had this evening. So thanks a lot. We hope you found it as enjoyable and useful as uh, we did. And back to you guys. There will be a recorded version of this webinar. Um, take a look at the ASC website. Uh, we'll, we'll tell you how to get to it. Um, so if you want to share this with some other folks that uh, you feel might be a benefit to, um, even though they didn't attend and register to attend tonight, it's going to be available for them. Uh, there'll be a link off our website. So uh, we, we hope that uh, I certainly hope that the uh, insight that I shared tonight is going to going to help everyone uh, with your test preparation efforts, your certification efforts, and more importantly, as I've said, and I'll say it again, with your your efforts in, in making yourself the best technician that you can uh, for yourself and for your customers. And, and uh, it's just it's uh, all a very good thing. And again, we appreciate you taking the time, making the personal commitment uh, to, to be here tonight with us. We appreciate you spending your time with us. And uh, I'll echo Tony's, uh, I'll echo Tony's um, uh, wishes for a happy and safe holiday season to each and every one of you. Uh, we've all been truly blessed. It's been a great year, and we're looking for a great 2013 with all of you. And just to put a final comment on that, John, uh, and a wrap on this webinar, is thanks again, everyone, for attending and spending your evening with us tonight. Uh, I hope you were somewhere comfortable as you took all this information in. It's uh, very, very encouraging to see the kind of response we've gotten predominantly here through the ASC email announcement about this webinar. And continue to watch your email inbox and our website for announcements about upcoming webinars as well as postings on the recorded webinars. And as John mentioned, this event was recorded and we posted for, uh, for viewing uh, at a later date. So once again, happy holidays to everyone and thanks again for attending.